You know, we can come in here and say a sinner's prayer and then go back to living life the way we were. Would you say that that person has really been changed by God? We'll go ahead and, and open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just want to thank you, God, for your love, Lord, for your, your mercies for us every day, Lord. And we just come before you tonight just to, to hear from you, God. So I just pray that, that no matter what has gone on in our day before, before we start, Lord, that our hearts will just be open to hear from your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you will just pour out your blessing upon this room, Lord, and that your word um, will just speak boldly to everybody here. God, we're thankful that we can come before you and worship and just hear your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So it's starting to feel a little bit like fall outside, or maybe winter for some of us. But this is the perfect weather for football. Um, I got a little bit of a Utes game that played on last Saturday. How many here would say that you are a Utes fan? Go ahead and leave your hands up for a minute. Okay, we got quite a bit of Utes fan in here. How many of you guys have paraphernalia, hats, banners, merchandise that you guys can wear or hang up at your house. Keep your hands up. Okay, we got a few. How many of you guys have actually been to a game in person? Ooh, still a few. We got hands going up and down. Okay, how many of you guys have a huge tattoo? I see one. One person. Does that one person have ticket to the Pac-12 championship game in Vegas? And that is nobody. So just like our few um, people that say that they're fans of the Utes, you know, we are fans up until so far. So this Saturday, I did watch the game, kind of. Um, I am from Southern California, so I was rooting for the other team. And it didn't work out very good for me this week. But, you know, as a fan, you know, that is short for fanatic. You know, the definition of fanatic is somebody that has a lot of enthusiasm about something or some place. Like, we talk about the Utes football. You know, everybody likes the Utes. They're, they're our local team. But, you know, how many of us are what we would say a fanatic about the Utes as to where we only had one person that actually had a tattoo of the Utes on them here at this church tonight? You know, that is a pretty diehard fan, because if you move to a different state or a different city, you know, wherever you go, you're going to be showing that, hey, I am a huge fan. But Jesus had fans, too. You know, we read in the Gospels about people following Jesus. You know, some of them were fans to see his miracles, to see people get healed from being sick. People were there for free food. You know, everybody loves free food. So let's follow this guy around and maybe we'll get a free lunch while we're there. But now if I were to ask you guys, you don't have to raise your hands for this one, who in this room would say that they are a Christian? And then maybe I would, no, you don't have to raise your hand. But maybe I ask you who prayed this morning or who has shared their faith with somebody this week? You know, who has not been angry or upset with people? You know, the more questions we ask, the more hands that would be dropped down. Because of those things that I just mentioned, I could say that I haven't done all of those this week. You know, just in fact, earlier today, I was upset and a little bit angry. But we can say that we are a Christian, that we are a fan of Jesus, a fanatic. But how many of us if somebody from the outside were to look at our lives, would say that, you know what, you are a fanatic. I can see that Jesus is number one in your life. You know, you're always praying. You're always out there trying to help people. You're serving at church three to five days a week. You know, you're honoring God with your finances. You know, a lot of us say that we're Christians, but how many of us, you know, if we were put on trial for that, would we have enough evidence against us in our lives to convict us? Tonight, we are going to be in the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 14. But as we are reading about the, the book of James, and I'm kind of hinting on you know, us having the, 
the evidence against us. You guys would say, but Paul said in Ephesians, you know, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own works that no one should boast. And James is not going to be coming against what Paul is saying, but he's going to be expounding on it a little bit. So we're going to start in verse 14, and I'm going to read through the end of chapter 2. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of them says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was complete by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in this same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as a body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, as we're reading that, one of the verses that stuck out to me was verse 19. It says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know, when we look at the demons and their theology, you know, they knew who God was. You know, they believed um, that things that people in this world do not believe today. You know, if you were to ask them, do you believe that God is real? They would tell you yes. Do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? The demons believe that, but there's a lot of people that we can talk to today that are full of good works that would not believe that. The demon theology is probably spot on. They probably know more truth about God than we do. You know, we have his word that we can study him, but the demons sing him. You know, we read in scripture where the demons are in fear of Jesus. They say, don't cast us into the abyss, cast us into the pigs because they knew that he had power. There are people that will tell us that they are Christians, that they believe. But a lot of them will tell you that because it's easy. You know, we live in America, which is, is generally a Christian nation. So just to fit in, most people that you ask um, are Christians. But there are different things that the demon would know that are not true, because there are so many different religion, so many different things out here that for us it's easier to say, you know, we're a Christian. You know, I'm not a Muslim. They go around and they blow themselves up. I'm not a Buddhist. They don't even believe in a God. I am not a Muslim. They wear funny underwear. You know, maybe I'm not a Jehovah's Witness because I don't even own a bike. But there are so many different religions out there that teach a little bit of different things with a little bit of truth and then a lot of something else that the demons would be able to say that, you know, that's not real. You know, if we had a Renaissance fair here and, you know, they're talking about Mother Earth and this and that, you know, the demons know that that is not real. You know, the demons have theology to know who God is and what he says is true. But theology alone is not going to save them. If you look at the demons that say they have faith, they actually have fear of God. We got a lot of Christians in this world today that have no problem going out and sinning and then coming to church on Sunday like it's no big deal. But it says that the demons believe and they shudder. So if the demons believe and their faith doesn't get them to heaven, what about our faith that is different to them, different to theirs? You know, if we have faith, as it says in verse 14, 
What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith? Because even the demons have faith, but does not have works. You know, if we are a Christian, you know, if we have this faith that, that God is real, that he came in and, and saved our souls, then there should be something different about us. You know, we can come in here and say a sinner's prayer and then go back to living life the way we were. Would you say that that person has really been changed by God? You wouldn't know because we don't know somebody's heart. But we can see the fruit of somebody's life. You know, if they're in here, if they're serving, you know, where it says further on in that, it says, if you see your brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you say to them, go in peace, be warm, but you have food that you could have offered them, that you could have gave them, where is that showing your faith? You know, God says that we are to love people, and the way that we show our love to others is by serving them. Just as Jesus came, Jesus was the best example of love that, that we could ever have. You know, our goal as a Christian is to slowly become more and more like Christ. And what did Christ do? He came to serve. He came to love. When was the last time anybody in this room washed a stranger's feet? You know, that's just not something that we do anymore. But that's what a godly example that, that Christ was for us. So here... You know, we make it easy at Calvary Chapel. You know, if you guys see somebody in need of food, we have food all over this building. You know, Pastor Terry, week in and week out, is take some food with you when you leave. Maybe you need food. Take some food for you. We have food for you. Take some food for your neighbors. You know, we want people from this church to actually have a change in their lives. You know, Christ has came in and done something different in you to, to love on that neighbor that maybe before you were saved, you never said two words to, but all of a sudden Christ comes into your life and you, you start having empathy for people. You're seeing that your neighbor needs some food. Maybe two doors down is an elderly neighbor. Winter's coming. Maybe they need somebody to shovel their driveway. You never thought about that kind of stuff until you were saved. The saving faith that we have through Christ is going to show. You know, It's going to bear fruit. As we continue on about loving our neighbors, giving them things that they need, and just serving them to show our good works. You know, um, Abraham, as we can carry down a little bit further, he had faith. It says that when Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac to the altar. We read in Hebrews 11 about the faith that Abraham had. You know, as you go back to Genesis 22, you hear this story of God coming to him and promising him a son, that he will have descendants numerous in the sand, numerous in the stars in the sky, and they wait and they wait and nothing happens. And then finally, after five years, come back to him and they have a son named Isaac. And as Isaac's growing, God comes to him and says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. And what does Abraham do? You know, he could say, I have all this faith in God. You know, I believe that you were going to give me a son. You gave me a son. But this is where I draw the line. You know what? I am not going to offer my one and only son to be sacrificed. But he did. He honored God. He believed God. You know, it doesn't say whether he was trusting that God would resurrect him from the dead or what would happen. He just said, you know what? God has been faithful up to now. He has given me my son. I'm going to do what you say. And if Abraham wouldn't have, it wouldn't have said that his faith was complete by his works. As he took Isaac up, you know, God presented himself a sacrifice. So he didn't have to sacrifice him. And the scripture was fulfilled in that. So as Abraham had his faith and he showed it, he didn't humble himself and, or hide behind his fears about his one and only son. It kind of shows us a little bit of God's love for us. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to take your son. I'm going to offer you my son. My son's going to come down and be an example on how to live. He is going to be the one that is going to, as it says here, um, justify us as righteousness. You know, we have done 
nothing to be called justified, to be righteous. It is what Jesus has done for us. And as we read a little bit further in verse 25, it's referencing Rahab. And it says that she was a prostitute justified by her works. And when we go back to Joshua to read and see the story of Rahab, you know, she lived in the city of Jericho, you know, a pagan town. The Hebrews sent some spies in to see what was going on. How are we going to be able to, to win a battle against these guys? And why they were there, you know, they had Rahab who hid them. You know, she had no relationship with God. We don't know if maybe she heard rumors, you know, the Hebrew people has this God going around them and they're winning all these battles. But she trusted them because they said, you know, if you will hide us, when we come to destroy your city, you will be safe. You know, as she had these guys hidden in her house, if they would have been found, she would have been killed. You know, she was risking her life to honor these guys that hopefully they keep their word. Hopefully when they come back, they don't kill her along with everybody else. And her faith was proven true that when the city of Jericho was overcame, she had the thing hanging out of her window. They came and they rescued her and she was safe. And now, not only is that story, you know, great for them, but it's told to all of us. We could see how faith through sinners, you know, we go to Hebrews 11, which is like the hall of fame of faith. And we read about Abraham. We read about Rahab. Uh, a prostitute. How many of us in church are going to look at a prostitute as being somebody that has great faith? But God chose to use sinners like us. You know, we are all broken people. We have all done things and fallen short of the glory of God. But by His grace, He chose each and every one of you to be used by Him. You know, not just to come to church and be fed the word and just say I have great faith so that I can argue with people about Facebook on theology or you should do this or you should do that. He's like, no, I have came and I have saved you because I have good works for you. As we read towards the end, he says that he received his messengers, sent them out another way, for the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead that we don't want to hold on to our faith. We want it to have work for people to actually see that you know God came into this person's life and they are different from they were before on how I knew them. He says, how are we different? You know, is there evidence in our lives? If somebody were to come up and ask your friends, like, hey, is this guy really a Christian? You know, I see that he goes to church or that they post stuff on social media about, about Jesus. You know, as, as Travis was saying, you know, I believe that we are in the end times. And what have we done to actually show that? You know, are we out here in this city of Salt Lake just sitting here waiting for Jesus to come back? Or are we out there doing something to win more souls to Christ? There's like a lot of people talk about having a cure for cancer. Are you going to keep that to yourself or are you going to be going out and sharing with others? Because as Travis is doing ministry in prisons, um, in recovery stuff, we have a CR group that meets here on Thursday night. And for you guys just to know that the Travis Lee Band will be back tomorrow. They're going to be here playing for our Utah Food for Families, and then they're going to be doing a little concert for, for our Celebrate Recovery because God changes lives, and we see that here on a daily basis. And you know what? If we were all to just sit back in our house and not share, not serve, like look at all of us parents in here with all of our kids out there in that children's ministry today. You know, most of us wouldn't be able to sit in here and listen to a message on Wednesday night or Sunday mornings, or even on Thursday evenings without the hearts of those servants who are choosing to minister to your kids while we're in here being fed. 
you know, we have great opportunities. God has given us all gifts to be used by him. And it goes along with what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Most people just stop there because it just says, by grace I have been saved, you know, not by my works. But when we read 2, 8 through 10, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has prepared each and every one of us for good works. You know, we all have different skill sets. Maybe you guys are good with kids and can be back there with Kim. You know, maybe you guys don't like little kids and you guys can come join me with the junior high and high school kids. You know, that is a great ministry. You know, coming up here and preaching to you guys is awesome, but 90% of you guys that are in this room already know where your relationship with Christ is. If you really want to make an impact with somebody, when you hit them through 6th and 12th grade, you know, that's when the world's coming against them. That is a great time to minister to kids before they leave for college, before they go out on the world on their own. We have our Utah Food for Families here. You know, that is so much fun. Watching the lives of people as they come and build food boxes. If you guys have never been here on a Thursday night, I highly encourage it. Starting tomorrow, it's going to be a little bit colder. Um, We're going to have the cool ambiance of our fire barrels back out there. And it's just, it is a lot of fun to see people's lives change because we do pray for every car that comes in here. And there are so many hurting people that don't know about Jesus, don't know that there's a God in heaven that loves them. You know, maybe you could be on the prayer team and as you're praying with somebody, they just start sobbing and you invite them and you talk to them about Jesus. You guys form relationships with people. The whole life of a Christian is forming relationship with others. You know, we are to love God and to love others and we can't love on others if we're not forming relationships with people. So here we have so many different opportunities for you guys to find out what kind of workmanship God called you to. Maybe it's at your work, at your business, trying to witness to your coworker, trying to share love with people. You know, the Bible tells us that we're going to go through trials, we're going to go through hardship, that God's going to comfort us. Because as we've been comforted by God, you're going to have unbelieving friends, unbelieving families that are going to go through trials, that are going to go through hardships. Um, So many young people struggling. You know, as a pastor, we come up here and we get to do great things. We get to do weddings that are happy days. But lately, it's been a lot of funerals. It's been a lot of funerals for young people because people are hurting. There's so many people overdosing on drugs. You know, being a part of our, our CR group, that are reaching out and helping people that are struggling. You know, God has given us all, created us for his workmanship. You know, each one of us has a different story that we can utilize to to reach others. And I'm just praying that while we're here tonight, that the Holy Spirit is really talking to you guys on how can I be used for God? What has been my workmanship that he's called me to? Did he call me to pack up my family, get in a motor home, and go lead worship across the country? Or maybe it's something easier as maybe take your neighbor a box of food and go say hello and introduce yourself to him. And, you know, just tell them that there's a God in heaven that loves you, and I love you. And if you need anything, I will be here for you. Because I know so much of us don't even know who our neighbors are. And, you know, how can we say that we are a Christian and that we love God and we love people and not know who our neighbors are. So I just want to leave you guys with that thought. You know, maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know, I don't really love people. I don't have a relationship with a God in heaven that loves me. So maybe that's why you're here tonight. Maybe you're here so that you can leave knowing that there is a God in heaven that loves you that wants to come inside of you and make you new and give you that hope and that peace 
that only comes from him. And if you don't know that, we're going to give you guys an opportunity just to, just to pray and invite Christ into your heart. So if you guys would bow your heads. And like, Lord, for those that are here tonight, God, those that came in here searching, Lord, I pray that you will just speak to them, draw them near to you, and let them know that, yes, that it only takes faith in you to be saved. That all they have to do is just just cry out, Lord God, I am a sinner and I am broken. And God, I want to be made new by you. Lord, teach me to walk with you daily. Lord, just forgive me for my sins and make me new. And you know what? If you pray that prayer, God will come into your life and he will make you new. And the funny thing is, is he will give you that desire to go out and be a blessing to others. Because I know so many of us that before we were saved, it was all about us. You know, we were a fanatic for a football team or a fanatic for something else. But now we can actually be a fanatic for Christ and that he does change lives. I will pray and then you guys will be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father God, we just want to to thank you, Lord, that you would come and you would choose us, Father, to be your tool. Lord, that there are so many better ways that you could come and, and share your gospel. But Lord, you chose broken people. God, that you could use our lives as a testimony, our brokenness that has been healed by you to share with others. You know, we have each been created with a special niche, Lord, something that you have given us a heart and a desire for. So God, I want to thank you for choosing us. Lord, I want to thank you for the great servants that we do have in this city, Lord, to share your love. Lord, that can come out on Thursday nights and just bless others. So Father, I want to thank you that we are in a place where we can come and just worship you out loud and sing praises to the God. Lord, that I pray as they sung tonight, Lord, that, that you will take our feet much further, Lord, where we cannot reach. God, that you will challenge us, that you will stretch us. God, that you will let this be a, a place where people know that, that lives are changed as they leave this building. God, as that sign says, as we pull out of the driveway, that we are entering our, our mission field. Lord, I do pray for each person in here, Lord, that you will just fill them with a spirit of boldness, God, that they will reach out and meet their neighbors, Lord, that they will pray with people, Lord, that our lives, if we were put on trial today, that we would all be found guilty of being a fanatic of yours. And God, I just do lift up everybody in here tonight, Lord, that you will just keep them safe on their way home, Lord, and watch over them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.